Number 1. Port Royal Port Royal, Jamaica was a well-liked port of call for robbers and pirates of all stripes during the golden age of piracy in the late 17th and early 18th centuries. The Little Harbour's connection to raiding dates back to the middle of the 1600s when the governors of Jamaica gave it up to pirates as a safe haven in return for Spanish protection. After the buccaneers agreed to the terms of the agreement, the town quickly developed into a major hub for French and British privateers, who were ship captains hired by the Crown to obstruct Spanish shipping in the Atlantic and Caribbean. One of the most famous of these state-sanctioned pirates was Sir Henry Morgan, a Welsh captain who used Port Royal as a base of operations for raids on the Spanish strongholds at Portobello, Cartagena and Panama City. Thanks to its pirate economy, Port Royal flourished, and by the 1660s, its streets were crowded with taverns and brothels ready to serve the whims of young buccaneers full of Spanish booty. According to contemporary accounts, the harbour was a seedy place where prostitution, gambling and alcohol were rampant. The hard-living sailors would frequently lose hundreds of Spanish reels in a single evening. The so-called wickedest city on earth remained a haven for a new breed of lawless freelance pirates long after the age of privateering had ended. But Port Royal's colonial officials were ultimately prompted to act when these attackers started indiscriminately stealing cargo in the Caribbean. By 1720, the town had begun to clean up its act, and its gallows point became a notorious site for pirate hangings. Among countless others, buccaneers like the ruthless Charles Vane and the flamboyant calico Jack Rackham would eventually meet their end in Port Royal. Number 2. St. Mary's Island Most people associate the Caribbean with swashbuckling sea captains and peg-legged pirates, but the Indian Ocean was home to many of the most prosperous buccaneers. Well-armed bands of freebooters began utilizing Madagascar, an African island, as a center of operations for raids on European and Asian shipping in the late 17th century. Some of these innovative thieves even established a utopian settlement named Libertalia, where they intermarried with local women and established a democratic government, according to pirate legend. Libertalia is probably a myth for sailors, but there were other pirate strongholds in Madagascar, most notably St. Mary's Island on the northeast coast. With a population of about 1,500 during the 1690s, St. Mary's was an important supply station for pirates such as Captain Kidd, Thomas Chew, and Henry Avery. Many buccaneers from St. Mary's would attack ships bringing exotic commodities from India as part of an underground trading agreement, and local traders would then sell the loot to shady merchants in towns like New York and Boston. Several of these raids were among the richest crimes ever committed. For instance, in 1695, Henry Avery attacked a treasure ship that belonged to the Great Mogul of India with a fleet of six ships. After a brutal battle, he fled with treasure estimated to be worth $200 million. Number 3. Tortuga a colourful cast of robbers, pirates and runaway slaves used the rocky island of Tortuga as their main stronghold in the early 1600s as they preyed on Spanish treasure ships in the Caribbean. Originally from adjacent Hispaniola, now Haiti, these raiders were a group of French hunters and their dreaded nickname, Buccaneers, came from the French word for the meat curing process they used, Buccaneer. Following the arrival of Spanish residents in Tortuga around 1630, the buccaneers departed Hispaniola and soon switched to the profitable trade of piracy. To support their operations, they made Tortuga into a fortified stronghold. Jean Levasseur, a buccaneer leader who had once worked as a military engineer, even built a 24-gun castle called Fort de Rocher to help guard the island's harbour. Pirates began to travel to Tortuga in large numbers, drawing raucous men from as far away as England, Holland and Portugal. As additional would-be raiders came to the island, they banded together to form the Brethren of the Coast, a loose fraternity of thieves, and created their own set of rules. 
Many of the brethren were commissioned by England and France as privateers, and they caused the Spanish great inconvenience by repeatedly attacking Tortuga. Later, the buccaneers accompanied Sir Henry Morgan on his well-known attacks along the Spanish main, but when privateering came to an end, their importance decreased. While a few continued to prowl the Caribbean for several decades, Tortuga's buccaneers had all but disappeared by the beginning of the 18th century. Number 4. Clue Bay Although the west coast of Ireland may not seem like a popular destination for pirates, one of the most fearsome female corsairs in history made her stronghold on the rocky sands of Clue Bay in the 16th century. In an era when numerous regional chieftains dominated Ireland, Grace O'Malley broke with tradition to become the head of a seafaring clan that governed the coasts via extortion and looting. O'Malley, also known as Granuale, led attacks on rival clans and commerce ships with hundreds of men and about 20 ships out of her centre of operations at Rockfleet Castle. She also ran afoul of government officials, who made repeated attempts to curb her activity. When a fleet from Galway besieged her castle in 1574, O'Malley led her pirates in a counterattack and forced the ships into a retreat. After being apprehended in 1577 and imprisoned for a few months, O'Malley was back skulking the waters of Clue Bay by the 1580s. She was known for her brutal fighting skills. A well-known story has it that she shot and killed a Turkish buccaneer just a day after giving birth. But she also had a strong grasp of politics thanks to her hands-on leadership approach. O'Malley petitioned the Crown for redress after her son was eventually taken prisoner by English colonial authorities and her ships were impounded. She then left for England. She even succeeded in getting her fleet returned, and she herself negotiated her son's release at a historic encounter with Queen Elizabeth I in 1593. Number 5. New Providence the Bahamas island of New Providence was well known as a lawless nest of pirates for a long time before cruise ships and tourists began to frequent there, and with good cause. The island's capital, Nassau, provided a secure harbour for pirates to refuel and repair before venturing off in pursuit of loot. The island was strategically located in the middle of the busy trade lines between Europe and the West Indies, by the 1710s, some of the harshest clients in the Caribbean were frequent visitors to New Providence. Its beach taverns and bars were frequented, among others, by raiders such as Charles Vane, Steed Bonnet, and Blackbeard. Eventually, pirate activity in the Bahamas got so bad that the British administration started to worry about the colony's long-term viability. Three warships were sent to New Providence by the Crown in 1718, along with a new governor, Woods Rogers, a former privateer who became a politician. Governor Rogers showed scant mercy to those who resisted, but he granted a pardon to any pirates who turned themselves in. Some, like Benjamin Hornigold, even went on to become pirate hunters. When he put a group of guilty pirates to death at Nassau in December 1718, he delivered a frightening warning to ungracious buccaneers. From that point on, New Providence gradually changed from being a haven for thieves to one of the primary hubs for Caribbean anti-piracy activities. 